I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm impressed by the presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. So friends do this kind of, they are not totally you know, strict in what they say. It's not 100% true all the time, but it's really very nice. So thank you. So it's, it's a privilege for me to have uh, Julio as a chairman of this presentation. I'm also very happy to be here in this community, uh, as uh, Lorenzo mentioned in the morning, where we try to exchange ideas from different disciplines. And, and I trust it's very important if we all together try to move on our uh, research topics I think we need to do and to bridge these uh, areas more and more. It's never uh, easy. Uh, well, Julio has been doing this for more than 10 years to be, <laughs> to be on the phone. And, and, uh, but it's very interesting and very, and, and I'm also happy to learn from Lorenzo that there are many people here that's the first time they come to uh, ICDL, which I think is great. It means that the community is strong, is vibrant, and new people. And uh, so part of what I will say, maybe it's uh, part of it, it's already familiar to some of the audience who have been around these topics before, but hopefully it will be new and intriguing for the, the, the newest uh, uh, um, incoming people. So I, I hope all together there will be a nice balance in, in the presentation. So this is the title that uh, Lorenzo told me that I should <laughs> give to the presentation, so here it is. Um, and I divided the, the presentation in, in these four parts. So I'll tell you about uh, a little bit about our research motivation, uh, which is in a way the, the research landscape or the, the approach that we kind of take at uh, ICDL. And then I will uh, bring you through a journey on uh, some of the work that we did uh, and we continue to do on the modeling the affordances. What are affordances? How can they be modeled? Why should they be, how useful are they? So how can we use them to, to build robots and to understand human cognition? Um, different possibilities of extending this work. And then uh, uh, another topic that uh, maybe was not in the request from Lorenz, but I think it's exciting anyway. Uh, it's about action, understanding, and anticipation that is to some extent also related to the first topic. So I'll try also to bring you on a tour of some of the ideas here and then maybe try to close the loop in some aspects and, and discuss um, <clears throat> and have a little bit of discussion in here. Interesting. Is, here. Yes. is the sound okay? <coughs> okay, thanks. Right. Uh, so in, in a way, this, this approach, and it's not uh, unique to what we try to do uh, in, in our lab and to Julio. When I first met Julio, no crazy professors around <laughs> when I first met Julie, so we already had these this kind of ideas. So to, to use machines to better understand how biological systems work. Um, at the time, our interest was insect vision and the honeybees. Uh, then it evolved to human scale and human cognition. So uh, what we try to do here is to use uh, <coughs> machines and uh, engineering uh, principles, uh, mathematics, computer programs, whatever. Uh, to try to build machines grounded on, 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 on ideas that we believe are biologically plausible. In the hope that when we are building these machines, these artificial machines, it will also provide insight as to how these biological machines are engineered. <clears throat> there is a, an underlying assumption that somehow we believe or that the, the creator, this is more philosophic, that creator, whoever you may want to consider, uh, had some engineering training or engineering principles or uh, optimality, and we are trying to find sometimes what are these uh, princi design principles behind. So if we want to do this, then uh, there are many uh, aspects <coughs> that we need to take into account. Of course, uh, we are engineers, we design robots, we like robots, so we have to find a way to justify the robot in this, in this uh, setting. And we all know that the, the brains are not simply floating in the air, and, and a lot of the, let's say, the design of the brain and the way the brain is, uh, operates is pretty much shaped uh, by the fact that it's connected to a physical body that interacts uh, with the world, that there are senses, there are signals. Uh, so we have to have uh, physical systems that, uh, that extend the presence in, of the brain uh, with respect to the rest of the world. There is a social dimension that was also mentioned here today. So if we want to understand the, the, how humans uh, function, 
then we also need to understand uh, uh, how uh, this is revealed or structured or engineered in the brain and somehow our approach needs also to, um, to incorporate some of these ideas. Um, well, it was mentioned uh, today in the first uh, in the first talk. So, what, what is cognition? Uh, so, there are many many definitions of cognition, uh, as many definitions of intelligence. Uh, and I, so I'm I'm not going to give a formal definition. So I, let's say, as an engineer, it's not in, on the top of my priorities to do this. But certainly, I think we more or less agree that all these ingredients uh, need to be uh, included in, in, in what we may call uh, a cognitive system, maybe to different degrees, that depending on uh, it, the perspective of each one of us. But there needs to be uh, adaptability, there needs to be anticipation, understanding what's going to happen in maybe in a few seconds or, if, or an hour or next day. We need to understand the context. Uh, there, we have discussed language and communication, verbal, nonverbal, perception and action and interaction with humans. And there is this example that I think I first got it from Yanis Alimonos. And I think, well, forgive me about the weapons, the military dimension, but I think it's a very nice example of cognitive systems. I'm not sure these guys had a training on engineering or cognitive science, but it's very interesting because they are manipulating an object. They know how this object operates. They understand that something is going to be wrong in a very short time ahead seriously wrong so they they immediately react to the fact that their prediction so uh, um, triggers a reaction so it's pure cognition in action and and i also i think this is maybe even more interesting because there's another group of guys possibly not cognitive scientists or engineers also those guys are psychologists and they seem uh, from the distance to understand what these other guys are doing that something is, a, is going to be wrong and without uh, well to be Honest, I don't know, but without any verbal communication, they take a decision based on the indirect observation of the behavior of the other guys and the manipulation of the object that was not uh, running 100% right. So these are many elements of cognition that are here very I mean, in, 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 uh, involved in just a couple of seconds of view. So the way we have uh, been very uh, fortunate to work uh, for over a number of years is in this rich ecosystem like ICDL, uh, where uh, we put together, this is more or less me as an engineer, so the, the engineers and computer scientists. Then we have people from psychology, um, mostly developmental psychology, and also people from uh, neuroscience. And, and, and of course, these different communities neuroscience and psychology, they carry on different types of experiments, maybe electrophysiological studies uh, with the monkey or behavioral studies with a, a newborn or, or a child or a toddler. And then out of these experiments, there are a number of hypotheses or questions as to these uh, animals might be uh, taking decisions or, or, or working. And then what we try to do in, in, in a dialogue with these communities, try to formulate those questions and try to model the behavior of those, the, well, the monkey and the child, for example, and then try to test this computationally or, or with a robot. And if we can replicate somehow parts of the behavior that we see in this uh, other experiment, then we may in the process understand uh, a little bit better what is happening on the biological side. All going well, and it does not happen all the time, but it does happen sometimes. Uh, when we are doing the engineering side, we may also raise uh, uh, other questions, and we may suggest a different hypothesis or a new experiment, excuse me, to the other side. And then maybe the, the, the teams in psychology or neuroscience, they may consider that it's interesting, and they may try this other experiment that may confirm, or maybe not, some of the hypotheses that we are building in this, in this interaction. So this, I think, is very rich. It's uh, difficult because languages are very different and the approaches, but it's a very rich uh, uh, environment to raise these questions and do this kind of uh, research. So the, 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 the zoo in the lab that we use uh, for these uh, experiments, so this guy is Balthazar. <laughs> Balthazar is our senior kind of humanoid robot. In fact, it's like maybe one third of humanoid. There's no legs, only the right arm. Uh, 
it was designed many years ago. First, only the head, then with robots you can attach the, you can grow the body when you want. Uh, then we had this anthropomorphic uh, arm a few years later and did many, many experiments and trying to model visual motor coordination. So mostly vision, but then visual motor coordination, grasping. And we have, so Balthazar is now uh, retired uh, after maybe uh, 10 years of uh, working life. So, it's, um, so but we use, we use this a lot in, in the lab. Then you see over there one of the first prototypes of the head of the ICAP robot that, that Julie already mentioned to you. Uh, this is uh, the, the ICAP, so as, as you know, it's, 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 it's the outcome of a wonderful project because we developed uh, a common platform where not only engineers but also labs in psychology or neuroscience, they could all host, well, at least theoretically, uh, uh, an animal like this or a robot like this, so we could carry experiments in, in the same community, exchange the algorithms, the, the, the um, the work we do and, and, and therefore be able to extend our research much, much faster and, and, and deeper. And so I think it's a great idea that was put forward by, by Julio at the time and I think it has really, we managed to do a lot of progress by sharing these ideas uh, together and working with the, the ICAP. This is in fact uh, one of the, um, I think this is uh, when the robot cap project was in operation that was this this the, one of the first meetings was in lisbon this is uh, 2005 this was one of our first prototypes of the head part of the head uh, that we had running at, at this time and this was the consortium so julio is here didn't change anything uh, and and see some of several of the people who were strongly involved here, while well, George Matt is here, David Vernon, uh, I'm here, uh, Clive Van Osten and Sherstein, Old Billard, uh, Ophi Ispert, uh, Luciano Fadiga, so this, this uh, Rolf Pfeiffer. So this community of engineers, psychologists, uh, neuroscientists together trying to build this machine and then use this machine as an instrument to uh, study uh, human uh, cognition. Darren Caldwell is also there and I will skip this, some of the other names. So it was very exciting times. Uh, then we also built, more or less we started at that time, uh, VC, this is the, the it's, it's, it's not totally, we call it a segway, so, uh, so we don't have legs, we have wheels, so we built this guy in Lisbon in the lab, and we use it for social interaction, and, um, and of course I think this is a slide I borrowed from Lorenzo at some point. Uh, so we are, trying to uh, design in, and use these uh, robots, not because they have amazing uh, control or dynamic properties and so on, but we designed these robots uh, to understand principles of human cognition uh, in this case. So most of the experiments that we run in the lab are with uh, Balthazar, or they were with Balthazar, we'll see experiments with Balthazar, and then the ICAP, sometimes with Vizi. Uh, and, and many of them in the context of international projects, uh, quite often with, with the gang in, in Genova uh, and many other colleagues. There is, um, uh, it also connects a bit to this uh, developmental robotics idea that has been put forward for, for uh, quite a long time now. And this is, of course, a very strong simplification uh, from the engineering side. Uh, so yesterday I was in a workshop where the, all, all of this was kind of questioned. And so although it's a simplification uh, for engineers, it's interesting to, to look at the, the, the development of, of uh, newborns uh, where there is a, a period in time where essentially uh, there is a process of fine tuning all the motor skills. There is this myelinization and motor babbling uh, and, and the, the, the child is learning how the brain, how, how the body operates essentially. So it's a serial experimenter doing a lot of uh, exper experiments with its own uh, limbs. And then there is a second period where once the body operation is kind of uh, mastered, then the child gets interested to explore the world around the, the child and then uh, it, it starts a period that is kind of dominated by experiments in physics. So it's again an obsession for experimentation, but now it's physics. So they learn about the laws of gravity, they learn that some objects are bitter, some are hot, some are cold, and so on and so forth. Um, 
light to weight and so on. So they do this and experiment over and over and over until they kind of get a grasp of how the physics of the world actually works. And then after a long period like this, um, there is another start, a new phase that maybe never ends, where the child uh, is going to do uh, social experiments. Again, an obsession with a new class of experiments now directed towards other individuals of the, of the same species. And this is, again, it's a stimuli reaction understanding. So if, if I'm at school and I bite my, my, my colleague uh, next to me, so I'm, am I going to be very well appreciated by the, the community, or instead there will be a strong opposition to my behavior? So it's understanding the level of acceptance of what we do in the context, the social context where we live. Um, and this is, so we, we sometimes try to guide our robots and development of the robots through these phases over time. The, the movie in down, in, in the last movie, it's actually an experiment. So I have twin daughters that were produced for experiments in the ICDL spirit. And this is, a, don't tell my wife or, the, or my children. And this is a, I mean, just a, a video shot that they were playing, and I think it's very nice because one is doing something that's not particularly I mean, purposeful or intelligent, and the other one is, is replicating. So I think there is a strong component here of this social acceptance interaction, and maybe some of the mirror neuron structure that, uh, that uh, make us, uh, well, create a sort of a bias towards imitating actions that we observe from others. So I like this video particularly because I think it's a little bit of an evidence of these two aspects. So what I will um, focus uh, today is maybe more on the middle level. So where we, so we did some work on these sensory motor parts uh, that are very, very interesting. And, and still there's a lot of work to be done there. And we have seen some of this in this conference. But then we are, maybe I will uh, draw your attention more towards this aspect of uh, being aware of the world. Um, so about these affordances. So affordances for engineers is a strange concept. It's not strange for um, psychologists. It was proposed by James Gibson. And it's this uh, interconnection uh, of uh, actions, uh, objects, and effects. And basically, when I look at an object, um, it immediately suggests uh, a possibility of an action to me. So when I simply the observation of an object uh, creates uh, um, a tendency to, to action possibilities that I, I can exert on this object. And when I act on this object with those actions, then some consequences will happen. And this will be the effects of the actions being executed upon those objects. This is also a very dear aspect that we have discussed with people from design, so the affordances of objects in the context of design. And I think this Maybe it would also be interesting to have some design people in, 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 the, in the one of the next uh, editions, maybe. And, and, but this was, a, and it is still, I think, for, for, for engineers, uh, a sort of a not straightforward uh, concept. So uh, if I want to learn, uh, so we, we, we had, we tried to collect and to discuss in the lab and in the projects that we were developing together with our partners and friends, we tried to come up with examples that would illustrate what what the affordances are in real life. And this, I think, may be one of the examples. So it's a, it's a basculating door. I don't know if it's the right word for this. Uh, it's something that, it's an object that is familiar to all of us that we have been using throughout our lives many, many times. And of course, it's when I come here, so I've never tried this exact door before, but I knew how it uh, works because I've seen doors like that before. But it may go wrong. If you manipulate the object and, and you, 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 you remove some of the aspects that make it work in the way that your prediction tells you it should behave, then our models suddenly, they, they, they mismatch reality. So throughout um, our uh, lives, so we, we experience over and over hundreds, thousands of objects, and we collect these examples, and somehow we create an abstract model that will allow us to use objects similar to those uh, later on in our lives. 
And we had a sort of a competition in the lab to find videos that thought, well, this is really the next best video to illustrate. And there are many examples here. Let me see. Well, I'll just have to work. This, well, there's a uh, large man with, with, with a microphone. And then suddenly, <laughs> the object elicits a behavior that, uh, you see, so it suddenly triggered another action that was not totally appropriate for that specific context. So these are affordances in, in practice. So our brain gets excited and suddenly those other actions come forward. <laughs> and there was another one. If this is running, this is also quite good. But I advise you not to do this. It's a breath analyzer context. And you have this guy interviewed by police, the, the breath analyzer. And suddenly, the affordances. <laughs> so you should not do this. But these are these, these are just a couple of examples to to, to understand better what affordances are. Uh, so in in the brain, so there are uh, neurological foundations for this. Uh, there are visual motor neurons that that uh, can be related with affordances. So I'm told. Uh, and what they do, so they 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 react uh, when you grasp a certain. Uh, class or shape of objects, like grasping a ring, a cylinder, or a sphere. And that's OK. That's what we expect from a, a, a visual uh, neuron. But they also fire when you simply uh, observe an object that can be manipulated in that certain way. So mm, you don't have to observe the action, but simply the, uh, the observation of, a, of an object that can be subject to that specific action is enough for the neuron to start firing. So it seems that. That's how the brain identifies the affordance, that that object can be used in a specific way. So what is this? A it's a chair. Why is this a chair? Because what makes it a chair? Because I think mentally we imagine that we can sit on this object. Okay? Uh, what is this? Chair. It's also a chair. But I'm a computer vision person. And, and visually, these objects are totally different. How come for us it's kind of the same object? Because the functionality unifies these two objects in spite of the very different, uh, what is this? this? This is a table, this is easy, and this is another table. Okay? So what makes an object a certain object is not only the visual appearance, maybe, well, there's a role in that, in the shape, but also the functionality and the affordances it provides to us. This is something I show to my computer vision students. Uh, so what object is this? It's a banana, OK? And now I, if I just manipulate a couple of pixels, and I do you know, machine learning course, and uh, I just manipulate 5% of the pixels, what object is this? <laughs> and then suddenly it is a pen. Uh, so if, if I give this type of object to many neural networks and such, I think it's going to have a hard uh, time to distinguish why such uh, a small number of pixels that have changed, why the, the interpretation and classification of the object changes so dramatically. And of course, you can spend time in the internet and finding other types of uh, bananas related uh, uh, phones, USB keys, uh, blah, blah, blah. So learning about the forenses, I think this is also, uh, maybe I borrowed this from Lorenzo, also this video, or Atabak, I'm not sure. Uh, so, uh, in a certain period of our lives when we dedicate ourselves to study physics, so the first time we study physics before entering university in engineering, uh, we, we do lots of experiments of this kind, so uh, uh, pushing, grasping objects and understanding what's happening and so on. And if we do this over and over and over and over, so maybe we understand how these uh, objects operate and how they uh, modify their states uh, as a response to our actions. So this is kind of what we try to do with uh, Balthazar. So we built a, a, a playground for Balthazar, pretty much well, with thousands of more mechanical problems than the, the human child. Uh, but we had Balthazar in, in a playground, so playing with objects that were available in the playground. So trying these uh, actions kind of at random, and then trying to observe what, ha what happens with different types of objects, and, and then trying to figure out how this triplet of uh, objects, uh, actions, and effects are connected to each other. So we collected this data. 
and we try basically to learn a graph uh, between all these uh, three types of entities. Uh, this is what we, uh, this, is, this would be our uh, affordance model. And we did this at the time, uh, then we used other uh, approaches, but we did this at the time using the Bayesian networks. So we could collect those, uh, those data of the experiments of Balthazar in the playground at random. And then uh, we could uh, extract the graph and the probabilities that connect each of these entities, the actions, the objects, and the effects to each other. And what is interesting, uh, for example, in some of the experiments that we did, um, it turned out that was Balthazar's particular experience of life, that the color of an object in, in the set of experiments that we had conducted was irre irrelevant to understand the behavior of the object. It was not a distinguishing factor between different types of objects. And this is why uh, in the network that we, we extract then, so the color is not connected to this relation with, between actions and effects. So this learning uh, process, when we uh, estimate the network and the probabilities, we can automatically extract what are the properties that, that can uh, classify a certain type of objects as belonging to the same class of objects. <coughs> so an object is not defined in advance by, let's say, visual properties, but it's defined by the way uh, it works in practice under uh, our actions. And, and, and the role of actions was raised several times today in different presentations, and Drew also pointed to this uh, many times. So I think this is an interesting uh, model. And, and if we consider this uh, model that we have learned in this case, uh, uh, so it can actually bridge so the lower level uh, sensory motor maps with more uh, higher level kind of uh, tasks that, that you may want to understand uh, with humans or to try to experiment with your robot. So we believe it's, it, it's an interesting bridging block in between. So the model itself, so it, it puts, it connects objects, actions, and infects, and, and we can query all going well, we can query this model in, in, in different ways. For example, I may have uh, an object, I, uh, I may have an object in my hand, I may have chosen uh, an action for some reason, so I can predict what is the effect of throwing this object to the glass window. So there, there's a prediction capacity of the, the, the effect. So this can be applied to my own behaviors, or it can be also be applied to the behaviors that I observe in other people around me. So I can predict what will happen if I saw this to the glass window, but I can also predict what will happen if somebody else does this action with that object uh, towards the glass window. Um, then I can do, uh, so let's suppose I have an object that someone is manipulating. I cannot see the object very precisely, but I can see um, the effect and maybe the observation of some properties of the object and observing the effect, I can understand that what was the action that this person was executing, okay? And I can also um, plan my own actions. So if I have a rock and I have a window that I want to break, a glass that I want to break, which action is the most uh, suitable one to achieve that goal? So I can plan my actions or I can recognize the actions of others and I can also do object recognition and selection. Let's suppose I see an action and the effect, I cannot see the object, but I can kind of have an educated guess what kind of object this person uh, uh, was using. I could see the hand moving and I could see writing on the paper. I can guess that the person was using the pen, for example. And I can again do this to uh, recognize the objects that are being used by others and, or I can select the object that I want to use. Um, so we have used this, so we have learned this affordance model with the Asian networks in, in different cases. And then one of the examples how to use this is to recognize actions when uh, we are doing learning by demonstration that was also discussed here today. And when we want to understand the actions that the demonstrator is doing, sometimes it's, it's ambiguous. And understanding the, the, the affordance of those objects that are being manipulated may help us a lot to understand the actions that, are, that we are observing. And this is one such example. So we were coupling this. Um, so there was a robot or a computer looking at this person doing a, a, a say, recycling game. So paper goes to one uh, basket, uh, plastic goes to another place, these kind of things, separating different kinds of materials. Uh, and the robot does not know the rules of the game. So what we did was so we used the affordance model for the robot to understand the actions. 
And then having estimated the observed actions, we use an inverse uh, reinforcement learning method to understand the, the, the reward or the rules of the game that is or the task that is being demonstrated. And then after understanding the, the, the reward, then we can optimize and get the policies that, uh, that solve this problem with the artificial system. Uh, yeah, so the big objects, the, the person asks for help. Uh, and this works pretty much well with Balthazar. So this is again Balthazar after observing, a, I think it was in the range of 100 demonstrations of these, understanding the, the rules, the, the, well, the actions, and then with the reverse enforcement learning for understanding the rules of the game. So it could kind of, uh, well, it's a bit uh, clumsy, but could, uh, could perform this recycling game by itself. So this is an example of how to put affordances in practice. So understanding the functions of objects is also very, uh, in this example, a very uh, uh, useful uh, cue to understand, to, to recognize the actions that are being performed by others. But of course, it can be used in all these other ways that I mentioned to you. So that, just to understand that we are uh, in the same page, so what object is this? This is easy, okay? This is an umbrella, no doubts about this. Uh, clearly the same. Uh, so it's primarily uh, the functionality that defines what an object is in the end of the day. Uh, and so we have discovered these, we humans, and, and it's, it's not, it's not uh, well, other, other, we are not alone in this uh, exciting discovery. Well, okay. Then uh, we have extended this, uh, idea of the affordance in, in different uh, ways. So this is, for example, with the idea of uh, using tools. Uh, this is a work that was, uh, well, when Lorenzo spent some time with us, uh, two years, three years, four years, four years, uh, four years. It was a very exciting period. Uh, and, uh, and Lorenzo was very much interested in working uh, in this idea of uh, learning how to use tools and, uh, and uh, with, uh, with Alex. And we, so the idea was to extend our original work that we have on this triplet of uh, objects, of entities, actions, objects, and effects, to, um, to, to, an, to, to a situation where we had actions, object, actions, effects, but also different uh, objects, and the objects could, an object could interact with another object. So I could try to learn what is the effect of at, uh, in, actuating with object a on object B. So object A would play the role uh, of a tool in this case, and object B will be the, 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 the so the object that was uh, being used uh, with the tool. So we use this uh, idea, uh, again, with different uh, methodologies, with the Bayesian network, but then with other uh, methods, to try to understand how these uh, things uh, interact with each other. And we use this for doing work with the ICAP, for the ICAP to learn how to use tools. And in this example, and I think Atabak was showing something like this, <laughs> kind of the similar, yeah? So the ICAP has objects, and some objects are out of reach. And, and uh, so there are some tools available, some other objects that can be used of tools to bring this object within reach. So, if the, so the robot has understood in the first phase of uh, understanding the interaction with the objects with these affordance models, that by using a rake is, is a good shape to bring other objects closer to the robot itself. And so we use this um, many times to try to understand which shapes would be more, uh, let's say, efficient or successful to create a certain effect upon other objects. Um, yeah, well, this is, uh, yeah, this is the, the example. So we had uh, well, the networks uh, uh, kept uh, expanding. Now we have objects and, and uh, tools uh, and properties that we could measure with vision or, or, or with, uh, well, mostly vision. Uh, and then we try to understand the interconnection and, and the probabilistic uh, relationships between uh, all these entities. Of course, there's I mean, many parameters. I mean, it's hard to put more objects, more actions, so that there were a few complexity issues. But I think it was very powerful. Uh, and we managed uh, to have the ICAP learning how to use tools. So this is the, in the, uh, let's say, learning uh, phase where the robot is trying objects uh, 
performing object, uh, actions on objects with other objects to see which properties they have, uh, if, if they can be uh, later on used as, as tools or not. So this is the learning phase. And I think here is already the, when the object, uh, when the robot needs to, uh, to bring an object closer, it will ask for the most suitable tool because it has learned this before. And here the human helper will provide the tool to the robot. So the ICAB is difficult to grasp these tools on the tabletop, but it could identify what is the tool shape that was most, that would most likely produce the desired effect upon the other object. Another extension or um, sort of related work that we did that I like very much that maybe we never really, uh, maybe we could extend this further because the first tool that humans uh, use are our own hands. So uh, looking at the shape of our own hands when we manipulate objects around, so maybe this can also be used as, as a learning mechanism to infer what are the shapes that are most suitable in tools that we experience later on in our lives. So this was a bit the idea in this, uh, in this uh, work here. Uh, well, Atabak is here, one of the authors, Lorenzo, Alex, myself, Giovanni is not here. And, and this was presented and discussed in ICDL in 2017 when we had this in this. Uh, well, we did other experiments, for example, adding a component of, uh, a soft component of uh, language, so spoken language. Uh, here, what we did was trying to have the, um, to have the language dimension added, so and basically we have the same probabilistic model. So we have uh, so someone is narrating the what the robot is observing. So the robot is trying to learn the affordance model, and at the same time we are recognizing isolated uh, words, and then we are trying to attach these words to the nodes uh, in the network. So basically, expanding the the network with with the nouns, verbs, and so on. We are not using any grammar, so this is really very simple. It's grounding uh, isolated words, uh, but we could, for example, extract the nouns that were associated to words or objects, properties, and so on. Uh, and I believe this is um, like a video. There should be some sound. So we have these narrations, and then the, the robot is picking up these uh, nouns and. and is stepping the yellow ball, and the ball is rolling. And in the end, this gets incorporated in the model. And for example, we can give uh, some very very simple uh, language uh, commands to the robot. We can then it will use the, the affordance network with the language grounding to execute a certain action, for example. So this was some very well initial experiments in this direction. And I will skip this. Uh, <clears throat> so there are many technical developments that we can do uh, on, 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 on this. For example, Atabak over there was using uh, the noisy uh, autoencoders for learning these affordances. And we could, for example, uh, have continuous variables uh, as opposed to discrete uh, variables that we had before. We can have online learning as opposed to batch learning that was our previous approach. And then we can also uh, further generalize this to new objects. So there are a number of uh, more interesting capacities that we could extend uh, in this way. And then, of course, um, this is also worked by Balthazar, sorry, by Atabak. <laughs> and, uh, and, and here the idea is, so uh, in some cases, we are defining the features and the properties of the objects, properties that we can measure upfront from our visual algorithms, but we can instead go all the way straight to raw data, to images and pixels directly and try to have the networks to extract this inf what is the relevant information there to predict the outcomes of actions and what is the what the images in the future will look like. So this also uh, is, is a way of extending this uh, work of... Um, so I think we have discussed this before. Um, how much time do I have? Ten time. Okay, so this is, uh, I hope, uh, I think it's a very powerful uh, tool to learn the affordances of objects that we can learn with these robots, with experiments, and I think it also provides us a building block to build uh, more complex behaviors uh, afterwards. What I'd like to mention now is uh, still in the same spirit of understanding actions, objects, uh, but talking a bit more on action understanding and anticipation. I think this was shown before. I showed this to my students, so when I asked, so what, is, uh, what is this? And uh, well, they said, well, it's a person walking, no big deal. 
uh, and then these are engineering students in the world, but if I give you uh, this data, and this is the, what, what, what we are observing, so I, I give you the same data, so a collection of point coordinates over time, and then you, you make a program to tell you immediately that this is a person walking, and then this is how I try to motivate. That is really magic, how we suddenly recognize these things uh, immediately and without any apparent effort, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. Uh, this is probably related to the mirror neurons that we worked together in a project with Julio and the, uh, Luciano Ferrar and others. That was very interesting, but I will skip this, um, s uh, this um, part. But the fact that we know how to execute some actions that are in our motor repertoire might uh, allow us to uh, decode and recognize similar actions performed by other animals with similar bodies. Um, and then there is this um, idea of action anticipation. So remember, one of the key uh, aspects of human cognition is to the capacity to predict, to anticipate. It was also mentioned many times uh, today. Uh, and this is a very nice example that I borrowed from uh, Julius Sandini. Thanks for the slide, Julius, with the fantastic uh, special effects. So there is a, an action, a sports action here. So it's a, it's a basketball shot. So it lasts 1.6 seconds, roughly. And now the question is, was this shot successful or unsuccessful? What's your stay? No. No? Yes, maybe, okay. So it seems to be hard, but we are trying to predict, maybe we are trying to predict the future, which is never totally easy, but we are trying to predict the future 0.1 seconds ahead. That should not be such a big uh, challenge. But it's still, it's hard to take the decision. So the guys who conducted this experiment, so they went further and they tried to run this experiment in a slightly different way, which they call a gated experiment. And they show slices of video, okay? So there are two actions here, and, I'm, and, and this is a display of slices of video. So here it's point, so the whole action is 1.6 seconds, and here is 0.6 seconds, more or less. Is this going to be successful, this action, and the other one? Any thoughts? <laughs> okay, maybe this is too difficult a question, so but if I'm generous enough and I give you 0.2 seconds more of video, is it easy now? Is it better? So this is the idea of the experiment. And if you do this, uh, and if you ask subjects when, so if they think the action will be successful or not successful, and you see when they, they get it right above chance, what is interesting, uh, well, this is a few more seconds of video, of course, well, the top one is successful, I think, and the bottom one is not successful. So if you see the entire sequence, then it's easy. But if you ask these subjects, uh, what is uh, striking is that, uh, so the, the, the basketball champions, they, can have, they, they have a good uh, guess uh, at 0.6 uh, seconds of video. And this is totally shocking because the body is still, uh, still not straight, the ball is still in the hand and so on. So it's, it's amazing how they can uh, predict the, the future so well, these guys. And if you have uh, subjects that are experts, but not champions, not as experts as the champions, then they need uh, 0.7 seconds to get this level of performance, which is still striking. If 0.7 seconds is still here. So the body is not totally uh, stretched, and the ball is still not flying in the air. And then other non-experts, they get the buff chance at about 0.8 seconds, basically when the ball starts uh, flying, it seems that we can kind of understand the slope of the, of the ball, and then integrate the trajectory and have a reasonable guess. Um, so for the, the professionals, uh, keep in mind that they don't even need to look at the trajectory of the ball because there, are, there is enough information on the action itself, on, on the movement of the body, to be able to predict the future uh, in, in, in a good way. So this is, uh, well, uh, being uh, Portuguese and coming to the UK, uh, uh, I, I want to bring another example, and I will give an example of Cristiano Ronaldo um, predicting the future. Uh, this is a corner kick, uh, and then they switch off the light, no light now, 
but Cristiano predicts the trajectory of the ball, the timing, every, everything, and then it, it scores the goal, picks, hits the ball in the right moment, right time, and scores the goal. And then they change the moment where they switch off the light. So it's, <laughs> it's shocking. I'm totally unacceptable. <laughs> now it's with the foot or with the head, anyway. And, and he sometimes uh, he can predict the trajectory of the ball and all of this even before the ball started moving. So just interpreting the, the, um, the movement of the guy who's kicking the... So this is uh, really interesting. And this is an example that is very f uh, interesting. The Klaus and Austin had that, uh, I mean, even children with just a few months of age, they, they predict, well, I tell the engineering students that these children are solving differential equations, which they, in a certain way they are because they are doing this linear uh, movement, uh, well, the first law of Newton, interpolation, and then they predict the future position of the object. And it's really appalling because many of our robots cannot do this in a, in a proper way. So it's integrating uh, differential equations. So we did experiments of this type of uh, trying to understand how our body movement and eye movements and all these passes on messages to people we interact with to understand uh, how this uh, synchronization or anticipation works. So we had a setup, typically it looked like this. So we have people doing stuff here on the tabletop, uh, manipulating objects, handing over. Uh, we were instrumenting the human subjects uh, with eye trackers, uh, with uh, motion capture system, and then trying to understand the movements they were doing. And, and for example, having uh, asking human subjects if they understand uh, and when they understand what action the other person is uh, executing. For example, placing an object on the table or handing over the object to the second person. And this was interesting. So we had this kind of experiments. This is uh, Mirko Rakovic from the University of Novi Sad that was working with us here at the time. And, and this, I think, it was an experiment with about six actions that the subjects had to choose to decide which action is being executed by, by this other person. And when the person moves the eyes, so basically we already understand what most likely is going to be the future action. And this is about three or four times above chance level. So we have a pretty good guess of what's about to happen. Simply when the, this guy mo starts moving the eyes. And then when it, he or she also moves the head, then this uh, likelihood increases. And then when also the arm is moving, then there is almost uh, complete certainty about the action that this other person is doing. So uh, we know from motor, human motor control that uh, eye gaze is very important as to anticipate uh, reaching movements and all that. So we are trying to measure this uh, and try to characterize this in this. Uh, and this is probably why our eye designs makes it easier, uh, relatively easy with contrast with the white part to read the guy, eye gaze of each other. So we, when we are close to each other and many other animals that are close to us, not other non-human primates, they don't have this characteristic and very likely they cannot read the eye gaze of others as accurately as we can. And they don't have this uh, level of performance in, in non-verbal communication mediated or anticipating the future mediated by the gaze movements. So we did many experiments uh, of this type. Uh, uh, so the, the green uh, ball is, is the fixation area. And, and when we are placing an object or handing over, it's interesting because at some point we are look at our hand, we look at the object, we look at the person we are interacting with. So there is multiple roles that the gaze is playing uh, throughout this action. So we try to, to measure this. Um, And to, and to model this in an experiment, so there was, a, so two people were assembling these uh, constructions. They were picking up objects from the side, and sometimes the objects were for their own construction. In some other cases, they didn't know because the objects were uh, hidden. They had to hand over the object to the other person. So this is not for my construction, it's for the other person, I, I have to hand it over. So we were measuring the data in this experiment. Uh, and then we try to create a model between the body movements, eye movements, head movements, uh, arm movements between person A and person B while they are doing these uh, handover tasks. So the way we model this, so we knew uh, how it should work by what we know about uh, the motor control theory. So we were modeling the, the gaze that goes ahead first. 
and then the arm movements and the wrist and so on and the head movements and we use the uh, uh, Markov model to, 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 to model this and the interconnection, the synchronization, so this is the model that is characterizing what person A is doing and this is the model what person 2 is doing and in the interaction there are, there are these interconnections between the two models that are running in, this, in the brains of these two people that are interacting. So we try to estimate these models from those human experiments and then basically we remove this person from here, we place a robot instead and we run the model inside the brain of the, the controller of the robot. So we hope in this way uh, to, the robot to understand and predict and anticipate what the person A is doing and is about to do. So this is, uh, let's say, desire number one. So desire number two is to have the robot behaving in such a way that its intentions will also be read by the human partner. So the, 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 the nonverbal language is such that the human partner will also be able to decode the intentions uh, of the robot. So this is the, an experiment uh, of this type where the, uh, well, basically, Nuno Duarte is here uh, interacting with, with the robot and the robot is reading signals from the human. So here we have the eye trackers on the human because the, the quality of the gaze measurements from a distance is still not good enough. And the robot is behaving in such a way that is f more or less following the model that we have observed uh, on the human experiments and, and the robot behavior should also be uh, uh, transparent and readable for, for, for the human. Um, yeah, this is an example of data that we process and trajectories, and I will skip this a bit for the interest of time. And this is, uh, oops, there was a picture here of Linda here. Well, Linda, this is work that we are now doing. So we are carrying on the, this work. Uh, so Nunu and Linda was uh, last week was uh, from, from Geneva, was with us a couple of months, and, and we did a very interesting work, uh, continuation of this work. With us. So this is important in many engineering applications. This is an example that I like very much and that I tell my students, and, and which is so when I'm about to cross the road uh, and I need to decide or not to cross the road, so I look around and I see cars and I have to decide whether or not I should cross the road. So typically what do we do? So I, I try to estimate the speed of the car, but in many times I will look inside and try to uh, estimate the intention of the driver. So we do this many times. So if the driver is looking forward or looking at me as a pedestrian, uh, I'm inclined to believe that the, the driver is aware of my is existence in that particular location in the planet and in that moment in time. So I assume that the, it's going to be relatively safe to try to, to, to cross the street because the driver is aware of my presence. If we come to the time where the cars will be autonomous, there's no driver there, so how do we look at the autonomous car and see if the car is aware of me or not. Is it safe to cross the road? So maybe we need to design uh, interfaces that, that uh, also borrow these ideas of non-verbal communication that we humans are used to, to, to use. And maybe we have to have, and these are the design guys also, so interfaces like these, so the, the autonomous car may have a pair of eyes and have saccadic movements and uh, direct attention. So I can, in this way, very easily, because I, I was designed by nature to understand this kind of signals, I can understand if the car is aware of my presence and what is the level of confidence that I, w that I have if I want to cross the street. So it's interesting in this type of applications to understand how we humans, uh, what kind of interpretation we have of this thing. Okay. Um, okay, so right now, ah, this is a picture of Linda. I didn't. <laughs> so we are we are extending this kind of work also, so understanding the actions, intentions, and and now uh, we have, for example, these two videos, um, and the difference between uh, these two videos is that in one case the cup is filled with some some content, some liquid, and the other case it is empty. <coughs> And we want to see if the, if, if the human, the receiver, uh, who gets the object, if he or she, and there are experiments that tell us that it is possible to understand the different physical properties of that object simply through the observation. So this is what 
We are doing uh, now experiments uh, of this type. Uh, uh, so Nuno has been working uh, in his PhD thesis uh, for a while in, in this direction. And now we have ongoing work uh, with uh, Lindra and uh, Alessandra <coughs> Schutti and, and co-workers at uh, IIT in, in Genova. And, uh, and I think it's uh, I mean, in line with all these projects that we have been developing together with uh, Julio and, and colleagues for so many years. So this is just a glimpse of the type of uh, information that, that we extract, so profiles of velocity, and then we see that these profiles change depending on physical properties of the objects, and we try to use this information of first to model and then to, to infer uh, whether or not we should be more careful when manipulating a certain object because of the specific physical properties of the objects. So in addition to the contents, the liquid, maybe there is dangerous, dangerous liquid or non-dangerous liquid, very hot coffee or just water, we also look at the, the rigidity of the object. If the object is very fragile or not very fragile, maybe we will manipulate it in a different way. And we, if we want to interact in a transparent way with, with this uh, human, human human interaction and human robot interactions, we may also need to incorporate these aspects in, in the picture. So these are again some experiments here with different families of objects uh, and we have been uh, creating some data sets and then we are learning uh, with uh, this, uh, all this data. Uh, this I've shown already. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm coming to an end.